Welcome to the webinar. My name is Rachel Usher. I am a project manager with the Georgia Climate Project, and I'm so thrilled to have you here today. Before we get started, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the Georgia Climate Project and who we are. Georgia Climate Project is a group of academic partners across the state, um, founded by Emory University, Georgia Tech, and University of Georgia. And as a group of nine, we work together to answer questions such as, what does a change in climate mean for Georgia? And what do we do about it? We are so grateful to our many funders across the state. Um, your work, our work wouldn't be possible without your uh, generous support. So as I mentioned earlier, the Georgia Climate Project answers the questions, what does a change in climate mean for Georgia and what can we do about it? And since our creation, we've built a variety of projects to help answer those two questions. One of the ones that we've built is called the Georgia Climate Information Portal. And what this is, is a website with all kinds of good information on how does the change in climate affect our health, our ecosystems, um, our coast. There are going to be more pages coming. Uh, these were written by experts across the state. And we really do encourage you to go check it out and explore. Um, and learn more about how a changing climate will impact our lives here in Georgia. Uh, as you may know, this is a series of webinars. Uh, this is our fifth installment. Uh, so far, we've covered a variety of topics, including what does a changing climate mean for Georgia's coast, Georgia's health, Georgia's ecosystems, and Georgia's water resources. Um, and we will be hosting more of these in the future. Um, this spring, we plan to cover what does a change in climate mean for Georgia's agriculture, equity and justice, and infrastructure. So for all of our past webinars, they're on our YouTube channel and their recordings available today. This uh, webinar today will also be recorded if you would like to share it with anyone else who is unable to attend. To catch all of our updates, feel free to uh, follow us on social media. We're very active on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We'll actually be live tweeting this event today with hashtag GCP webinar. Um, you can also learn more about us at our website, georgiaclimateproject.org. Later this year, there's a very exciting conference that'll be hosted in the state of Georgia by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. This is the statewide Georgia climate conference. It'll be happening in Jekyll Island, Georgia, August 12th and 13th. If you are a researcher or a practitioner and you have great information, research, projects to share, they would love to hear about it. Um, they have an open call for posters that closes May 1st. So be sure to go ahead and uh, submit anything that you've been working on. The registration for attendees opens in May. So um, to learn more about this very uh, exciting conference that's coming up, go check out georgiaclimateconference.org. Before we meet all of our exciting panelists that have joined us today, I wanted to go ahead and flag some quick Zoom updates for you. At the bottom, there are two different boxes. There's a chat and Q&A box. And as a participant, those are your tools to really interact with us. Your audio and video is going to be disabled for the duration of this webinar, but um, please feel free to chat it up and also ask any questions that you have of our panelists. After the webinar today, there is going to be an evaluation link going out. It should be a pop-up that comes right up on your computer when you close out the Zoom window. Um, we'll also be sending it in a follow-up email. Your feedback's really important to us um, and it really does help us shape and craft our future webinars. So please let us know how we're doing. And without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce what does a change in climate mean for Georgia's weather? Um, today on February 26th, we have a, a star lineup here to talk with you today. Um, and to kick things off, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator. Brandon Miller is a meteorologist and supervising weather producer for CNN, responsible for managing CNN's climate and weather teams. Brandon began his career at CNN in 2003 as an intern with CNN Weather, while still an undergrad at Georgia Tech. After completing his master's degree in Earth and Atmospheric Science at Georgia Tech, Brandis stayed with CNN in Atlanta and joined the World Weather Department in 2008. Brandon leads the climate 
Crisis Beat at CNN, responsible for keeping CNN worldwide TV and digital at the forefront of one of the most urgent crises of our time. Beginning in 2020, Brandon returned to his alma mater, Georgia Tech, to teach a course in earth science and climate communications. And I will go ahead and welcome Brandon to the floor. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and thank you, Georgia Climate Project, for putting this together. Uh, we do, we have an all-star cast here today. So, um, you know, as a native Georgian myself and somebody who's been interested in weather my whole life, the question of uh, how will it impact me is a question that is, um, you know, so important and, and communication really needs to start at the, the most local level. Um, how can we make it real for people? But the topics we're going to talk about today are in no way unique to Georgia. You know, hotter heat waves, uh, more extreme floods and just extreme weather and weird weather in general, uh, sea level rise, coastal inundation. These are problems that will impact cities from Savannah to Shanghai. Um, and, and so really, you know, it is a global issue, of course, that will require global cooperation. Uh, but it all has to start at the local level. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, that's why we have an awesome cast of people, uh, Melissa, Marshall, Daniel, here in the state of Georgia, um, looking at the impacts here and what we can do about it here in the state. Um, they study the science, they're experts in communicating the science, which is really important and not something that everyone uh, scientists across the board can do so. So we're really fortunate to have them join us today. Um, but they're also on the front lines of helping to tackle the issue and help us to prepare um, the issue of climate change. Um, some nuts and bolts will have each speaker will have 15 minutes. Uh, they'll present to you their slides. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have about four minutes each one for question and answer. Uh, so have your questions ready. Um, and I'll read them off of our, our Q&A here, um, and I'll read them to our speakers. And then at the end, if we can keep everybody on time, we will have a good bit more time so we can have more general discussion or pointed questions if you have them for any of our speakers. So uh, with that said, I will go ahead and bring in Melissa. And Melissa is... Uh, Melissa Hopkinson, she's a lecturer of Earth and Atmospheric Science at the University of North Georgia. She earned her undergraduate degree from Northwestern University and her PhD in Earth Sciences from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego. So as I look out my window at the uh, cold, cloudy rain, I wonder why you would leave that uh, in San Diego, but we're awful glad you did to join us here in the state. And uh, her research is involved the study of inert gases and ice cores and using that to understand changes in the ocean temperature during the last ice age. And in 2017, she became an academic partner in the Global Climate Project. So Melissa, you can uh, unmute and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And yeah, I do sometimes miss the uh, sunny San Diego <laughs> weather. <laughs> All right, well, I will start um, by sharing my screen with all of you guys. So um, as Brandon mentioned, um, you know, our topic today is a discussion of what a changing climate means for Georgia's weather. And I'm going to start by talking about what a changing climate has meant for Georgia's weather so far. So what has Georgia's weather patterns, what have they been like in the last few decades? Um, before we get started, I just want to point out this image. It's taken from a weather camera at the University of North Georgia's Gainesville campus. It's from earlier this week before the clouds came in, but we had these weather stations at all of our campuses, which is pretty cool for the students. All right, so these two terms, weather and climate, are in the title of our webinar today. And although they're similar, they don't mean the same thing. Weather is the current state of our atmosphere. It's short term temperature, precipitation, cloud cover. This is weather. Climate is average atmospheric conditions over longer time periods. So essentially, climate describes long term weather patterns. So both of these words, weather and climate, might be describing temperatures just over different time scales. 
So as you've heard, and I'm sure both in the introduction here and in general, our climate is changing. It has changed already and it's continuing to change. It's changing globally and it's also changing here in Georgia. So before we zoom into Georgia, I wanna zoom way out <laughs> to um, our global climate history, just to kind of put what we're experiencing now in perspective. So um, what we see here is a record of the last 800,000 years of climate. We see temperature in red and carbon dioxide, a gas in blue. These records come from ice cores from Antarctica. And um, just two quick observations I wanna point out. One, temperature and carbon dioxide have both kind of bounced up and down through this 800,000 years of Earth history. And there seem to be some kind of inherent thresholds there. The other thing I wanna point out through this period is that when temperature goes up, carbon dioxide is also high. So these are varying together. The final thing I wanna point out is if we go to the far right of our carbon dioxide record here, we see something completely different. Carbon dioxide starts to increase very quickly. And although it's present prior to our recent history, it's carbon dioxide is present in the natural atmosphere. What we see in the last century or so is a abrupt and large increase. And that's because there's been additional carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels. And the one thing about, um, well, many things, but the one thing of concern here is that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So it acts to trap heat given off by the earth, kind of like a blanket. And so the more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases like methane that are emitted into the atmosphere, the more heat is trapped in the atmosphere. And so we have in fact seen this, oops, whoa, don't wanna start yet. We have in fact seen this heating happen. And what you see on the upper right is global average temperature. Ever since we started taking temperatures with a thermometer, we call this the instrumental record. So we see an overall increase in temperature over the course of the last century and a little bit more. And when we look at this spatially, the same record from 1880 to the present, we can see an overall warming of the planet. It doesn't look the same everywhere. There's some places warming more than others, some places even cooling a little bit, but there's an overall increase in temperature globally. You see, as we're getting into the late 1900s, the whole world looks yellower, redder. Eventually we see the high latitudes amplified in terms of their warming. And so this is, as has been said earlier, a global signal. So now we've seen here, you know, a very clear visual of a change in climate globally. Now, if we zoom in on Georgia now, you know, we know that there is climate change happening. What does it mean for Georgia? Well, as you heard in the introduction, it means there's warmer temperatures. Warmer temperatures have been observed already. They are expected to continue. It means there's weirder weather, more extremes, more unusual events, and worse outcomes. Each weather event tends to have more catastrophic results. This is an image of a tornado outbreak last spring where a house was moved onto a road. Um, definitely worse and weird. Okay, so warmer. Georgia is getting warmer. And 2019 was Georgia's warmest year on record. That's what's shown here. Before that, 2017 was Georgia's warmest year on record. And much of the last decade has been um, above average or much above average temperatures in Georgia. And we see that trend towards warmer temperatures on an even finer scale here at looking at the state of Georgia on a county um, detail level from the 80s, 90s, 2000s to 2010s. And what you see overall is a um, shift towards warmer temperatures through these decades. Some places warm up more than others, but in general, we're seeing um, an overall warming across the entire state. 
And we expect that warming to continue. So what's shown in this orange graph is the observed temperatures in Georgia. And we expect them to continue to rise depending on our emissions, but our other speakers will talk more about that. I just wanna remind you that we're in a trend that is expected to continue. Now, a warmer atmosphere also affects our water cycle, the types of precipitation we have. So a warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor. That's the gas form of water. So I've shown here a very simple diagram of the water cycle. And given a warmer atmosphere is able to hold more water vapor, it has a higher capacity for water vapor. That means the evaporation, these up arrows here, are going to increase there's going to be more evaporation because the atmosphere is capable of holding more water vapor. That means that some places on land will dry out because the water, liquid water that was on the ground will now evaporate into water vapor gas in the atmosphere. Some of that water vapor gas will turn into clouds and fall as precipitation, possibly making some places wetter. So there's regional differences when we talk about how a warmer atmosphere will affect our either dryness or wetness um, in Georgia and around the world. So let's take a look at precipitation trends in Georgia. Um, if we look at the instrumental record from the late 1800s to now, there's a somewhat mixed signal. Some decades have more rain, some less. Overall though, in the last few decades, we've seen a decrease in precipitation statewide. So an overall drop in rainfall across the state. Now, despite the fact that we've had less rainfall overall, we've actually had an increase in extreme precipitation events. So that's um, days with precipitation above three inches, basically major downpour events. Those have increased. And what's shown here is the change in these events over the entire Southeast region. So we see an increase in recent decades. I wanna direct you over to the map though, where we can look closely at Georgia. So the red dots show where we see an increase in the um, occurrence of these extreme precipitation days. And the blue dots show a decrease in these events. So we see that central and South Georgia show an increase in these extreme precipitation events with the dark colors meaning really big increases. And then North Georgia, particularly on, along the mountains shows a decrease in these events. So this map shows us that changes in rainfall, um, especially changes in these extreme rainfall events are regional in nature. And so there's a lot of um, kind of complicated detailed work out here to figure out why these are these trends are happening this way. And here we see the result of one of these extreme downpour events. This is flooding in South Georgia in the spring of last year. Now these huge rainfall events are usually caused by strong thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are fueled by warm buoyant rising air. So a warmer climate is going to fuel stronger storms. One type of storm that we see often in our part of the world are hurricanes. And hurricanes are a type of storm that forms over tropical water. Hurricanes get their energy from warm water, which creates warm, humid air above it. Usually when hurricanes hit land, they dissipate or they weaken pretty quickly because they've lost their energy source. So what I'm showing here in this map is Hurricane Michael. Now Hurricane Michael was extremely, an extremely strong hurricane. It was a category five when it was over the Gulf of Mexico. And hurricanes are divided into categories one through five with five being the highest, and these categories are based on wind speed. So um, Hurricane Michael was the strongest type of hurricane there is, and it was um, approaching the Gulf Coast. It hit the panhandle, and it actually remained a hurricane 
It did not weaken into a tropical storm or less. It remained a hurricane and entered Southwest Georgia as a category three hurricane. So this is unprecedented. And as we know, it caused a lot of loss and destruction. And so once again, this warmer, warmer temperatures are fueling stronger storms. So I want you to keep in mind as we talk about hurricanes and storms in general hitting the coast, that coastlines um, now are experiencing higher sea level. So we see over the last hundred years or so that sea level along the Georgia coast has risen about 10 inches. And that sea level rise is caused by both warmer ocean water, water expands thermally when it's warmer, and by melting of ice um, in the polar regions. So basically our sea level is now higher, which means our baseline of sea level when a hurricane hits is higher. So when a hurricane hits a coastline, any flooding caused by the hurricane will be that much greater. We call that storm surge. And here you see a um, picture of a restaurant in Tybee Island, Georgia flooded after Hurricane Matthew hit the coastline. And that was a few years before Hurricane Michael. Now, the final um, point I wanna make is the ex other extreme in terms of water and that's drought. Like I mentioned earlier, a warmer atmosphere is gonna cause more evaporation from the ground and that will tend to dry out the ground. And what we see here in Georgia, this is the last 20, 20 years and we see the percent of Georgia affected by drought. And when these colors go all the way to the top, that means all of Georgia is affected by drought with the darker colors being more intense drought. So what we see here is that much of Georgia for the last 20 years has experienced drought and that has impacts on our water resources, our um, agriculture, et cetera. And here's just an image to leave you with of Lake Lanier near North Georgia campus in Gainesville um, during a low stand in 2007 during that pretty extreme drought. So um, to conclude, and as a reminder that weather changes from day to day, this is the camera footage of North Georgia this morning on a much wetter and cloudier day. So if we have time for a few questions, I, if you have any. Yes, Melissa, you were right on time. I <laughs> wanted to tell you, you had a couple minutes left and, and you were already finishing. So perfect, so we do, we have a couple minutes for questions. Um, and as I look out at that webcam and see that we are, uh, wedged in a little bit here you know what what is climate going to do to cold air damming that's what i want to know you know how many more cloudy days are we going to have that no i'm just kidding you don't have to answer that question um no we have got some really good questions that are coming in and if you have them uh please put them in the q a box there on your screen um will steinberg asked a question about the county map that you had and he said he noticed that atlanta area didn't necessarily have the highest temperature uh, maybe because of, of, you know, urban heat effect or something like that, you might expect that. Um, but rather it was some of the surrounding areas and he thought it might be higher in the metropolitan areas. Why is that? So I will um, also say that figure came from one of our other speakers. So Dr. Shepard will probably have more to say in detail about this, but you are right. Um, in some ways it's a little surprising, but at the same time, an expansion of the urban area, expanding man-made surfaces um, probably contributes to um, the expansion of heating. So the different color, the warming was the change in, you know, from the eighties to the 2010s. So I, I would say- oh, yeah. I, can, I can actually help with that because that, I think that- <laughs> Jump in. <laughs> I think that figure is being completely misinterpreted, actually. Um, that's actually a paper that's showing the trends and changes in climate vulnerability and heat. So she showed the heat mm -hmm. component of a vulnerability calculation that we published. So there's clearly an urban heat island, and I'll show that actually in my discussion. But once the heat island's there, it's there. It doesn't really trend too much. So uh, what you were seeing there um, is changes in places, as Melissa talked about, are now that are becoming more urbanized. So um, the urban heat island for Atlanta is firmly there. Uh, and so it, you know, buildings and places don't really move once they're there. So what that really was sure. capturing was places that where you're seeing the urban expansion into other places outside of the existing heat island. 
Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for jumping in. That was a great question, Will. Um, one question I have for you, Melissa, is I, I know that in our virtual audience today, there's going to be a lot of people uh, in the agriculture industry. And obviously weather plays a very important role in agriculture. So what will some of the, what about some of these changes that we've seen and even projecting into the future, what will that mean for agriculture, for their planting cycles, harvesting, things like that? Right, so we're generally, you know, overall seeing drier conditions. So that is certainly a concern. And I think the agricultural world is working on targeted irrigation to kind of save the little water that is there. Um, and I will say those extreme weather events, um, although a lot of rainfall is being um, deposited on the ground, not all of it is being absorbed because it's falling so fast. So it's almost like the rain we're getting, some of it is lost in the extreme runoff that happens when those extreme rainfall events happen, um, which also can batter crops. So it's getting more rain all at once is not as helpful as getting a steadier rain um, throughout the year. So I could, for many reasons, the agriculture is suffering from less water than previously, um, awesome. previous decades. Great. Um, and for more on that question, come back next month. Uh, Pam Knox noted in our, in our Q&A that uh, there's going to be more talk about agriculture in next month's webinar too. So uh, in my industry, we call that a tease. Um, so an another question that we had, and, and we've seen this a couple of different times. Um, this one comes from, where did it go? Uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, often we hear criticism of some of the heavy rainfall data, as well as things like hurricane data, um, that it's just improvements in instrumentation. We're just maybe seeing and observing these things more. And this increase is just, um, you know, because of that. Um, what would you, how would you answer that question, Melissa? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know if I'm I picking agree. the hard ones. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in if you're uncomfortable with it. Yeah, I, I, you know, if you have a good answer, I will definitely let you answer that, Marshall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Look, uh, one of the things that we talk about with the attribution study that I was an author on, we published this for the National Academies, and I'll allude to it in my talk. So we, some of these questions are excellent questions, but I'm going to touch on some of them in my talk, I believe, next. Um, we have these three pillars of the stool that we use in what we call attribution science, this notion that how do we link climate change to current extreme weather events? And the three pillars of the stool are our physical understanding of the system, uh, the observational record, and then whether the climate models can recreate them. And so if you go back and read that National Academies report, uh, we actually have certain ranges of confidence in our attribution skill. And for example, with hurricanes, we know we physically understand hurricanes and the links to climate change, but we know that the data record is truncated somewhat because we only have a good satellite data record back several decades or so. And so that's why hurricane confidence and attribution fell in the moderate, not the high range. So we do account for these sort of deficiencies or limitations in um, observational record. However, uh, there are some people that try to use that to suggest that climate change is not real or not happening. Um, right. we, 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 that the two aren't sort of synonymous. Yes, we have some truncated data records in some areas, but yes, we also know that our climate is changing and is likely having an impact on extremes, which, which I'll touch on next in my talk. Awesome. Well, we, we do have more questions, but we can get to maybe some of them at the end and, and feel free to add more questions, everyone, if you have them. Melissa, thank you so much. Uh, that was awesome. Melissa, talk to us about uh, sort of how the weather has and is changing here in the state as a result of climate change. Uh, Dr. Shepard, who's already been talking with us, is going to dive more into uh, how that weather is going to change in the future. So Dr. Shepard, you can stay on here and I'll introduce you. Um, Dr. Shepard is a leading international expert in weather and climate. He's at UGA and part of the Georgia Athletic Association, distinguished professor of geography and atmospheric sciences at UGA. Uh, he also serves as a director of UGA's atmospheric science program uh, in the department of geography there where he was previously the associate department head. Uh, before he was at UGA, Dr. Shepard spent 12 years as a research meteorologist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center 
where he was deputy project scientist for the GPM, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, which uh, launched up into space at 20, in 2014. Uh, and Dr. Shepard didn't even have to fly up there with it to, to go. Um, Dr. Shepard is, is an expert that you've probably seen on TV, has seen on TV. He uh, routinely is on CBS, the Today Show, Nova. He, he is an expert on a lot of things. I know at CNN, I've interviewed him both on and off the record, uh, probably dozens of times. Um, and then, of course, at the Weather Channel, he's uh, done a lot of things at the Weather Channel, including a Sunday talk podcast type show uh, called Weather Geeks, which uh, many are probably familiar with. Dr. Shepard received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in physical meteorology from Florida State University. So, Dr. Shepard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brandon, and it's an, an honor to be working with all of you uh, today and colleagues that I've certainly worked with over the time here. Uh, I am going to talk to you about Georgia and um, the new normal of weather and climate. And what you see there uh, is the scar left by Hurricane Michael uh, as it moved inland in North Florida and in the Southwest Georgia. Uh, I think Hurricane Michael was a galvanizing weather event for the prospect of how extreme weather uh, can impact not only our landscape, but our agricultural economy and more. So there are my coordinates. If you uh, aren't familiar with me or not following me on Twitter, uh, feel free to follow me there at Dr. Shepard 2013 because I, I tweet a lot of things about weather and climate. So uh, let's see if we can get this advancing. Uh, this is actually a figure that I took from a paper that I just published with one of my previous graduate students, Dr. KC, and it talks about sort of the intersections of climate change impacts, hazards, and risk, because increasingly this is how I like to talk about climate change and impacts on Georgia and what Georgia's weather looks like in the future. You know, I'm, I'm actually growing somewhat allergic to the, the prospect of showing trend lines and maps of temperature. I, th I think as climate scientists, we do it all, and I'll do it in this talk, but we've kind of beat that to death a little bit. We've got to put this more into the context of so what for people and those kitchen table issues and why it matters to Georgians that our weather is changing now, not in the year 2100. And uh, though we love cute, cuddly polar bears, this is not about polar bears, it's about Georgia farmers, uh, Georgia businesses, and everyday Georgians. And so that's really how I like to frame a lot of this discussion. So this is actually a, a broader look at a piece of what Melissa showed earlier. Uh, this is a paper that we published in 2015 where we developed a climate vulnerability index for the state of Georgia. And this index looks at uh, changes in extreme weather like heat, flood, and drought, and, and sea level, and social vulnerability within Georgia counties. Well, who lives there? How, what access do they have to air conditioning? healthcare and so forth. And one of the things that you can clearly see is that from the 1980s to the 2010s, uh, we are, Georgia's become more orange. So that means overall the state's climate vulnerability has increased due to these extremes and also who's living there. Uh, but if you look carefully, the urban counties and some of the coastal counties and even some of the, the south, southwestern and southeastern rural counties light up as even being more climate vulnerable. And what we found is that the counties in Georgia are climate vulnerable for different reasons. The urban counties you see around Atlanta and, and some of the counties like Macon and Columbus are more vulnerable to uh, vulnerable populations being exposed to more extreme heat and urban flooding. Uh, obviously the regions along the coast uh, deal with more coastal flooding, but then some of those counties that you're seeing in the southern interior of the state are vulnerable due, due to the uh, drought activity that Melissa talked about in her discussion. So uh, one of the sort of key lessons here points is that when we talk about climate vulnerability, extreme weather vulnerability, we can't talk about it with one broad stroke. There's nuance into what's causing vulnerability in different counties and who's living in those counties. So let's talk a little bit about Georgia's new normal weather. Uh, Melissa showed this, so I'm not going to spend any time on it, but this just shows you the observed and projected temperature trends. And it's important to realize that we do uh, project these changes based on different assumptions or emission scenarios. And so uh, I think it's useful to show those scenarios uh, and, and not just always the worst case scenario, although we're trending towards the worst case scenario. So that's why I kind of frown upon those and say, well, you climate scientists only show the worst case scenario 
scenario. You know what? That's the reason we do that is because in some ways the data is trending in that direction. Uh, some other worrisome trends that kind of get at the so what factor. I mean, I could have shown you a trend map like I just did, but this actually relates to things that people understand. This is from the National Climate Assessment and shows the changes in outdoor work hours uh, expected across the United States, including Georgia, as our climate continues to warm. So this is a way of conveying that we're warming and it has an impact on people without just showing a trend line that only scientists appreciate and understand. Uh, clearly, if you're in construction or in agriculture or other outdoor activities, uh, there would be a decrease in work hours over time as we see uh, more oppressive temperatures and humidity in the state of Georgia. Now, in 2019, I testified before the House Science Committee, and one of the things that I told them is that extremes are becoming more extreme, and that's what people notice. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about one and a half degrees and half degree of warming and two degrees of warming. That doesn't mean much to people. And so I, I try not to talk about climate change from that perspective. You tell somebody we're gonna have an average one degree temperature increase over time. They're like, great, I can barbecue more in December. They, they probably interpret that as a good thing. But the reality is the impact of climate change on our extremes is what people notice, it's what people feel, and it's what changes people's lives. So uh, in 2016, I was the, the co-author on this report that the National Academies put out on what we know about attributing extreme weather today to climate change. And so I would invite you all to, that's a free download, to take a look at it. It's a pretty hefty lift in terms of reading, uh, but it's certainly uh, something that you might wanna uh, take a look at to understand where we are on observing frequency, intensity, and duration of extreme events and linking them to climate change. Because one of the things we found in that report is that our understanding of extreme events and climate change uh, varies depending on the event. You can't talk about this one broad stroke. You can't say, oh, tornadoes are increasing because of climate change. Because in fact, if you look at that little black circle, that's severe convective storms. There's actually low confidence in the studies right now linking tornadic storms to climate change. That doesn't mean they ultimately won't end up revealing a relationship. It's just that that three pillars of the stool that I talked about can't support us elevating that to a higher level. So the areas that we have the highest confidence in climate change DNA being in current extreme weather is the reduction or lack of cold events. That's what cold is. Uh, heat waves, drought, and intense rainfall. As you see, tropical cyclones, hurricanes falls in the middle of the scale because of the truncated data record and the fact that our climate models just don't reproduce hurricanes very well right now. We'll get there. So I fully expect that this tropical cyclone hurricane will move further up the list and probably already has. Again, this report's about five years old now. I bet it's somewhere in here now. So this is how we need to think and talk about extreme weather attribution and climate. So as we think about Georgia, you heard Melissa talking about drought and extreme rainfall. And what I've found when I talk to the public or even policymakers on Capitol Hill is they get confused by all of this. They want a very singular answer. Tell me, is it going to be wetter because of climate change or is it going to be drier because of climate change? And I say both. And that just causes them to squirm and itch a little bit because it just isn't a clean answer. But the reality is uh, that we know that on both extremes, uh, we'll see changes. Uh, here are changes in extreme rainfall, the top 1% heaviest events. And you can see that in the Southeast, uh, the top 1% event of rainfall, the heavy rainfall events have increased by about 25, 27%. And here are some of the projected changes over time in Georgia. So uh, to sort of build on what Melissa talked about, uh, even in the lower to higher scenarios, we expect our rain, our heaviest rain events to become more intense. That has implications for Georgians because many of our stormwater management systems are engineered for the 1960s and 50s and 70s rainstorms, not the 2021 rainstorms. And so couple that with impervious surface and urbanization and we see more flooding. And so these are the things that we have to think about in terms of what are the impacts of Georgia. Let's not just present fact after fact showing that we're warming or wetter. Let's talk about how that what the implications are so you know, this kind of builds on melissa this is some work from brian brett schneider and, and um 
in uh, Alaska. Are we starting to see some of that? Well, again, remember the story is mixed. You know, there are places in Georgia where summer precipitation is actually increasing, but then there are places in Georgia where we're seeing little to no change or even drier summer pre uh, precipitation conditions. And we have to get accustomed to telling that story and explaining the implications rather than giving neat, clean answers that may be factually incorrect. What about hurricanes? Well, my colleague Brian McNulty from the University of Maryland, I'm sorry, University of Miami posted this just recently. Uh, we have just entered a new decade, so we're starting to redefine our climate normals. We define climate normals on these 30 year periods. And so uh, we now are in a new climate normal. And what you can see it from th this data is the name storms, hurricane and major hurricanes, there seems to be a shift upward in all categories as we look at the last several decades. Now, this is important because one of the things the peer reviewed literature is pretty clear on is we're probably going to see more intense hurricanes when they form uh, going forward, the Michael and Harvey type storms. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see more of them. That's what the peer reviewed literature suggests, although this data certainly suggests that that's happening. And so that has implications for Georgia, obviously. I think many people remember Hurricane Michael. Uh, you know, it was a really strong storm. It rapidly intensified before it made landfall in uh, Florida. That has implications for Georgia because if we're seeing these really strong storms uh, landfalling in Florida, they'll still be pretty strong when they get in the Southwest Georgia where we have a lot of pecans and cotton and other agricultural activity. Um, so we don't really get that many landfalling storms in the coastal region of Georgia uh, because of our coastline curvature and the why these storms tend to curve out to sea or back into North Carolina. But an implication for Georgia is if we are in an era of stronger storms making landfall in Florida, uh, are we going to see more agricultural impacts in the south and southwest like we did with Hurricane Michael, perhaps? All right, I'm gonna end with something that's very counterintuitive to people. What about polar vortex and winter weather in Georgia? Well, we just saw a disastrous infrastructure calamity in Texas because of an anomaly cold event. Now people's mind just can't wrap around the context of talking about climate change and cold together. It's just not how people's brains work. But the reality is there is some evidence that suggests that these sudden stratospheric warming events and warming events in the upper part of our atmosphere can destabilize or weaken our polar vortex this, and jet stream patterns such that we can get more intrusions of cold air into the lower 48, like we saw with Texas. Now, that very much could have been Georgia had the jet stream um, wave pattern had been shifted just a bit east such that that trough, this thing here, was low for us. It happened to be out here over Texas. So there is uh, interest in studying how cold events might be impacted by um, weather. Uh, I'm sorry, climate change. I will say in general, there are studies, they're still somewhat inconclusive at this point, that suggest that climate change is causing wavier jet stream patterns. What that means is not just cold events, but even in uh, summer or spring, if we have higher amplitude uh, troughs and ridges, that means more intense heat waves or stronger storms. And so uh, it's all connected. So I'll close with this graphic from a paper that Benita and I and others just published, excuse me, last year. It extends that Georgia study of climate risk and vulnerability to the entire nation and projects climate risk and vulnerability out to the year 2040. So you see top left hazards, exposure to extreme weather events, who lives in these counties from a vulnerability standpoint, and then ultimately what's the climate risk in 2040. Now, I don't, I, there, as I've looked at our own paper, I don't like some aspects of this because it tends to suggest that they're the, the more urban populated regions are the most vulnerable. It gets lost in there because of the scale that there's still vulnerability in rural areas too. So I, 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 I'd invite you to take a look at that paper. It's an open source paper that we recently published. I'm gonna end with two things, urban and rural. Urban, uh, we talk about greenhouse gas driven global warming and climate change, but I wanna remind us that the urban heat island is there because of the urban impervious surfaces. Most people in Georgia live in cities. And so we can't forget the triple whammy of global climate warming, uh, stronger and more intense heat waves, 
and then the urban heat island because people live in cities and so they're already experiencing elevated heat because of the urban heat island so that's a an ongoing issue for our urban populations and then i just wanted to mention this rural georgia because i know people talk about urban georgia and rural georgia i'm a native georgian like brandon miller i see one georgia but in <laughs> fact there are issues here and so i wanted to point people to pam knox my colleague at the university of georgia who just yesterday testified before the house agricultural committee on climate change and agricultural issues. So I would invite you to take a look at that testimony. It's available on YouTube. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marshall. This was this was awesome. And you know, followed Melissa's presentation quite nicely. Um, if you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the QA and I'll ask them. We got time for a couple of the questions here because Dr. Shepard was again right on time. We appreciate it. Um, one question that I had was was sort of going back and you you sort of already answered it. Um, looking at, at last week's Arctic blast and what it meant for Texas. Um, you know, on the uh, chart that you showed, you know, decreased cold was at the very top of that as far as, you know, linkages to climate change um, with, with heat being right below it. So how do we sort of rectify that um, you know, it, it makes much more sense to people to say in the summertime, we're going to have hotter heat waves. Okay, that's great. Um, but in the wintertime that we could have more extreme cold, <laughs> just sort of gets couched as, oh, you guys are just blaming everything on, on global warming. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, great, great point, uh, Brandon. Yeah, you know, people don't think it gets cold in deserts, but it does. Uh, it, you know, I just again, people's science literacy sometimes, and just even our own personal experiences, uh, just certain things are counterintuitive. So in that in that study uh, from the National Academies, we show in general that there's a decrease overall in cold, extreme cold events that the, the peer review literature bears that out. But what's interesting about that, though, is there is uh, research by my colleague, Dr. Judah Cohen, for example, and others that suggest that even though we're having this large scale um, decrease in overall cold events, we are seeing these really anomaly events happening more frequently. So, for example, Judah Cohen, who's a top expert, if you don't know him, definitely be, find out about him. He says, you used to get these cold extreme breaches or disruptions in the polar vortex every other year or so, or maybe every couple of years. Now they seem to be happening every year. So we don't get a lot of them, but when they happen, they're pretty extreme. And so that's, that's kind of how you reconcile it. And it's the same thing with hurricanes. Um, we might not get more hurricanes because of climate warming going forth. That's what the literature says. But when we get them, they're on average going to be stronger, likely more like, uh, inclined to experience rapid intensification. And there's even some peer review literature suggesting that they're slowing down or stopping like we saw with Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Dorian over the Bahamas. That's great. Dr. Shepard, you talk a lot about the impacts on humans. What about the impacts on animals and wildlife? Um, we have a question about what kind of wildlife changes might occur. So maybe some migrations to other regions or other mm -hmm. things moving here, um, possible extinctions. What can you tell us about those and, and why should we care? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, but I do know that we, we do see changes in migration patterns. And it, the, I, I gave a, a talk to the Audubon Society in Atlanta a couple of years ago. And so I learned a lot about birds from my good colleague, Dr. Bob Cooper at the University of Georgia. And one of the things I talked about there is that the bir the poor birds are confused because they they you know they they because of the changes in in sort of warming patterns and so forth that we see in spring which by the way affects things like our pollen exposure and our allergies and all you know the birds come back and the their food supply the insects and the grubs and the worms aren't out yet and so it completely sort of messes with their their habitat and their their ability to survive and so i i am i, I wrote an article I, i'm a, a senior contributor for forbes magazine i love that show the deadliest catch that comes on discovery channel shout out to anyone else who likes it there was an, a, a season where they were dealing with the fact that the aphilio and king crab were further out because of the warming waters and so they had to right. fish further out in the bering sea so clearly animals and our ecosystems respond to these changes too 
Awesome. That's great. So one last question I want to get in for you, Dr. Shepard. Um, Henry Slack asks here in our Q&A, says, I'm surprised there's not a greater hazard on Georgia's coast. Can you talk a little bit about sea level rise in Georgia versus maybe Miami, for instance, or versus the Northeast, where we hear frequently about, and we're seeing it a lot more, uh, maybe in, in Miami, Miami Beach, we see pictures there, seemingly every high rise. Um, what do we think about that rise being felt in Georgia? Well, I mean, again, the, the title of this webinar focused on weather. So that's why you don't see much sea level <laughs> uh, discussion here. Uh, clearly, there's an issue with sea level rise on our coast. Sure. Uh, saltwater intrusion, uh, changes in, in coastal inundation that my, my good friend and colleague or my colleague at UGA, Jill Gamble, and her colleagues talk all about. I know there have been webinars on that. So don't 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 take that we're not talking about sea level rise as that it's not an issue. It's just not the topical focal point of this particular Perfect. webinar. Perfect. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great answer. Um, okay, Dr. Shepard, we will uh, let you go back on mute and bring in our final speaker for today, uh, Daniel Rockberg. Daniel is a chief strategy officer of Emory University's Climate at Emory Initiative, an instructor in the Gangarosa Department of Environmental Health, at Emory's Rollins School of Public Health and a co-founder of this Georgia Climate Project. He spent 17 years with the U.S. Department of State, where he served as special assistant to the lead U.S. climate negotiators under Presidents Bush and Obama and was a member of U.S. delegations to multiple U.N. conferences, including 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg and the 2009 U.N. Climate Conference in Copenhagen, helping to shape the president's global climate change initiative as well as the U.S.-India Partnership to Advance Clean Energy. He holds a bachelor degree in human biology with honors in environmental science, technology and policy, and a master's in earth systems, both from Stanford University. So as you can see, all of our speakers today have very diverse backgrounds, which um, is really important when communicating climate change, which is one of those things that touches on everything, um, you know, we say at CNN, it's the beat that covers all the other beats, business and health, um, you know, literally everything you can do. And uh, Daniel's uh, an expert in a lot of those uh, areas. So Daniel, if you want to come off of mute and uh, enable your video, you can go ahead and start. The floor is yours. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, uh, Brandon. And thanks to really um, the whole team that's been organizing this GCP webinar series to Brandon and Rachel and Jill and Taylor and Jenna and Brandon Ellis and Swati and uh, many who are behind the scenes. But thanks a lot. This has been a great series and I'm grateful for the invitation to be part of it. I do want to pick up where uh, Melissa and Marshall have left off, which is a really clear explanation that Georgia's weather and climate are changing, have changed in the past, and are certainly projected to change in the future, which then begs the question, what do we do about these changes? And I really want to focus in on two very important opportunities for the state of Georgia. The first is to really focus on addressing the root cause of these changes, which is the emissions that are warming our planet, as Melissa mentioned, and to get those emissions to zero as quickly as possible. And the second is that even as we do the emissions reduction piece, we have to laser focus on the impact themselves and be quite intentional about making an investment in preparing for and adapting to those impacts. So I'm gonna unpack both of those over the course of this short talk. Um, let's see if I can get it advancing, there we go. So I'll start with just a basic, very simple conceptual framework uh, building on what Melissa and Marshall said. So they've told us that Georgia is warming and Georgia's weather patterns are getting weirder. And that if you take those two together, that is making things worse. It's making things worse for lives and livelihoods and natural systems in Georgia. So it is important to acknowledge and also underscore what's causing this problem to begin with. And that is uh, greenhouse gas pollution. The scientific community has an incredibly strong consensus that not only is greenhouse gas pollution causing this warming of our planet, but it's the dominant driver. Uh, it, it vastly dwarfs all the other natural variability we might see over years or decades or centuries. So the first thing that we need to be thinking about is a very clear focus, as I said, on getting our emissions to zero as soon as possible. And that's called drawdown in this context. Secondly, uh, we do need to recognize and acknowledge that we are already experiencing the impacts of a changing climate. Many of them have already come up in Melissa and Marshall's talks. They range from heat-related illness to rising seas to flooding inland and on the coasts, et cetera. 
So the second thing we need to be doing now and in the future is to really focus on uh, resilience, preparing for and responding to those climate impacts. And it's really important to note here that even if we are wildly successful on the first challenge on drawdown and we get emissions to zero, let's say today, uh, we've baked enough into the system that we're gonna be dealing with the impacts for decades to come. So we absolutely have to do both of these quite aggressively immediately. So these are the two things that if we think about Georgia and we think about Georgia of 2030, not so long from now, what would success look like? Success would look like phenomenal progress on both of these fronts. Phenomenal progress on getting Georgia's emissions down from the about 125 million tons they are now, closer to zero, as close as possible. And then also success in being quite intentional about building resilience. And I'm gonna talk about both of these uh, over the next few minutes. For the former, for Drawdown Georgia, uh, we have a very exciting new framework that I'll talk about um, called Drawdown Georgia, which allows us to think kind of comprehensively and holistically about the wide range of solutions we need to reduce emissions. On the resilient side, we don't have an equivalent of Drawdown Georgia, at least not yet. And I would say that if anyone on this call is interested, it's something that we sorely need in the state, is a systematic comprehensive framework for thinking about climate resilience in the state. For now though, uh, I think it's a good starting point to acknowledge that there are dozens of activities, small, medium, and large across the state that are going on to advance resilience efforts. And I'll talk a little bit about those. I will start though with drawdown. And as I do, I really want to uh, give a uh, public thank you to the Racy Anderson Foundation for bringing this idea to Georgia in the first place. The Racy Anderson Foundation um, not only supported and supports the Georgia Climate Project, but was also actively involved in Project Drawdown, which is a global effort to look at this uh, emissions reduction challenge. And they quickly identified the opportunity for Georgia to be the first state in the country and actually the first state in the world to take global Project Drawdown and scale it down to the level of a state. So that's what Drawdown Georgia is, is the first time ever someone has taken Drawdown globally and made it relevant in a statewide context. So thanks to them for bringing that idea to the state and also providing really important resources to get the process going. And I'll start here with the biggest picture about Drawdown Georgia. This is a global picture. I'm going to go back to where Melissa was at the very beginning. Um, we are at about 50 plus billion tons of emissions every year that's shown on the y-axis. Left unchecked, we're going to be emitting 100 to 150 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions by the end of the century. That is horrible for the planet. Uh, that puts us on the trajectory to be quite warm. If, however, countries around the world do what they have pledged to do in the Paris Climate Agreement, they implement the policies already on the books, our emissions trajectory doesn't look as bad. Uh, it's much lower, but it's still not good enough. It still puts us on a path for a lot of warming. If we want to avoid the worst impacts of a changing climate and really hit our global temperature targets, we need to be much closer to the green and the yellow lines shown here. And in fact, these are a little bit conservative. Um, the UN climate science body estimates that we have a 2050 deadline of having net zero emissions if we want to keep temperatures from rising 1.5 degrees Celsius. We have a little bit more time. We have until 2070 if we want to avoid a two degree increase. That's the entire planet of billions and billions of people uh, getting to zero emissions. And the really important takeaway for the work in Georgia is that absolutely everybody is on the hook for this. Uh, the United States cannot wait for China or India or Europe to go first. The United States needs to be going at the same time and really leading on this. Likewise, Georgia cannot afford to wait for Minnesota or California or North Carolina to go first. Georgia has to do everything it can within its power to do its part because the entire planet needs to be down to zero as soon as possible. The positive part of this, though, is that the countries and the economies and the states that move forward quickly on this are also going to see tremendous opportunity. There, frankly, is a lot of money to be made, a lot of jobs to be created by being on the front end of this new low carbon economy that's coming. So what does it look like then to reduce emissions in Georgia? Um, I mentioned Project Drawdown, which is a global assessment. Very helpful. It's a hundred different things that we can do to get to zero emissions globally. What we needed to do though, is get that down to a Georgia lens. And uh, this is where the Anderson Foundation comes in and a team of researchers led by Dr. Marilyn Brown at Georgia Tech, uh, a team from Georgia Tech, University of Georgia, Georgia State and Emory University ran a process to take the hundred solutions in the global effort and pass those solutions through a series of filters to come up with a list of 20 solutions that make sense in Georgia. And those are the 20 drawdown Georgia solutions. 
Here's a preview, or not the preview, this is the summary of them. You'll see they break down in five categories. There's electricity, buildings and materials, food and agriculture, land sinks, and transportation. And in each one of those categories, you'll see there are three to five solutions, retrofitting buildings or rooftop solar, coastal wetlands, et cetera. So an important takeaway, I think there's two key takeaways here. The first one is um, quite clearly there's no silver bullet for reducing our emissions to zero uh, in, in the short term. We have to do a lot of different things. And that's what this research really makes clear. Um, the other thing that this chart shows is uh, it gives us an opportunity, kind of um, a, a map and, and a way to think about much more granular concrete things that we can all do within our own lanes to make progress on this very amorphous big challenge. So it feels quite daunting to say, let's reduce Georgia's emissions by 30 million tons over the next 10 years. It's a little easier if you're in a field that thinks about managing landfills, though, for example, to think about putting a methane gas capture system on your landfill, or if you have a home to put rooftop solar on your home, or if you are a consumer of food to figure out a way to reduce the wastage of that food. And one of the things that the research team did uh, is actually quantify, what does it look like to get a million of Georgia's tons off the books by 2030? And this is, there are some of their answers. 295,000 homes in Georgia would have to go solar by 2030. That gets us a million tons of progress. Four landfills would have to install a gas to energy system. That would get us a million tons of progress. 12% uh, of our wasted food would have to be reduced somehow across Georgia, whether that's upstream in the supply chain or downstream at the consumer level. That would also get us a million tons of progress. And brand new, uh, posted on the Drawdown Georgia website now, is a visualizer that will let any of us to uh, play with this information. So I would strongly encourage you to go to the website listed here. This is just a preview of what it looks like. If you play with this tool, you see, first of all, uh, Georgia's emissions on net being, sorry, gross emissions being somewhere in the neighborhood of 170 million tons. Net emissions, though, being much lower because we have a tremendous natural carbon sink from our forests, which is great. And then if you were to activate the tabs, you'll see that these uh, emissions go lower and lower and lower depending on which solutions you put into place. So large scale solar is a big wedge here. Energy efficient trucks is a big wedge here. And you can play around with these. Lots of caveats, they're noted on the website itself. Uh, the team is still in the process of thinking about the nuances of this. So treat it as a uh, sort of starting point for a conversation uh, and something that's gonna continue to be iterated over the years. Another thing that the team did for Drawdown Georgia was think critically about things that are beyond carbon, uh, equity, economic growth, public health, and the environment, things that matter quite a bit for any of these policies and practices that are really important to consider. So for one example, it's great to think about 295,000 homes going solar in Georgia and getting the million tons that gives us in the carbon space. But beyond carbon, first of all, there's an upside for economic development and job creation, and that's really worth thinking about. But secondly, it's in incredibly important to think about the equity implications here. So first of all, whose jobs are being created? Uh, are there avenues in creating this new industry effectively to provide job opportunities for those who have been uh, fighting uh, against headwinds of structural racism or inequity? Likewise, who's getting the rooftop solar? Is it folks who are quite well off or folks who have an incredibly high, one of the highest in the country, uh, energy burden? Uh, that really need the help to lower their electricity bills and manage their increasing cooling load as the climate warms. So we need to be thinking about these holistically. It's important to note that Drawdown Georgia uh, doesn't exist in a vacuum. There have been people for years advancing very exciting solutions in Georgia, uh, and there will be people doing that going forward. Drawdown Georgia is not meant to be an umbrella for that, but rather a support sort of conceptual framework and building a community to support that. If you go to the Georgia Climate Stories website, you'll see a number of solutions. Uh, if you select Drawdown Georgia, that give you some examples. I won't go into them here, but suffice it to say, this is a very, very small snapshot of a much larger set of really great uh, things going on across the state to advance individual solutions. Uh, just a quick note on how you would get involved. Um, if you're already working on Drawdown, as I mentioned, um, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of organizations doing this work already in the state. Uh, feel free to share your work via the Group It tool that's available on the Drawdown Georgia website. Uh, there's also a partnership with Civic Dinners to host Civic Dinners on this topic. Uh, there's going to be more coming out from Marilyn Brown and her colleagues in the research team, including a greenhouse gas emissions tracker for the state. And there's a really phenomenal leadership council that has been uh, assembled to work on this. So stay tuned for more. I've listed their, their names here so you can see who's on that, that team. All right, so 
just got a few minutes left and I want to make sure there's time for Q&A. So what I want to do is briefly touch on the second half of this equation, which is resilience. So as we, as we have a warming in Weirding, Georgia, which is having a worse impact, what do we do to prepare for and respond to those impacts? And it's really important to understand that it's not as simple a problem as reducing emissions. We're building resilience to a warming Georgia, a weirder Georgia, and a worse Georgia in the following respects, right? All these things that we've talked about already, heat-related illness, agricultural losses, ecosystem disruption, each of these requires their own solutions in those sectors and in those geographies. And of course, the foundational underpinning of all this is already existing tremendous challenges all around equity and justice. So I'm just gonna give you like a teaser of a few examples. Uh, but I really want to underscore just that this is a way to think about these issues and just the tip of the iceberg of the work that is going on in Georgia and can. One set of work is around heat and heat related illness and equity and justice. There are a couple of very exciting efforts underway this year. Uh, I've listed a panel that Dr. Shepard will be on March 23rd, but a team of folks, Spellman, Partnership for Southern Equity, NOAA, Emory, University of Georgia, Georgia Climate Project, City of Atlanta, all thinking about this urban heat island that Marshall mentioned in the context of an overall warming climate. So there will be some citizen science efforts getting underway to try to identify, create very granular maps of the urban heat island in Atlanta. And then more importantly, think about what we do with that information and how can the city of Atlanta and stakeholders around the community build resilience to that heat. Another slice of this is thinking about how a warmer Georgia and a weirder Georgia affects ecosystems. This is a question that came in uh, that Marshall really handled well. Uh, if you had seen our ecosystem session a couple months ago, you will have seen there's a number of disruptions to ecosystems as a result of a changing climate. There are a number of ways we can respond. Here's just one slice from that webinar, just to highlight that John Ambrose from Georgia DNR presented of the incredible work being done to create uh, a, an ecosystem corridor essentially across the lower Altamaha River bit by bit, parcel by parcel, building a corridor that will help species that are under threat or disrupted by climate change move to new places. So that's an example of a climate resilience effort in that space. A third one is in the sea level rise space, uh, where we're going to see sea level up as discussed, hurricanes more intense as discussed, leading to coastal flooding with, again, a huge equity and justice uh, set of concerns overlaid on top of that. And here, there's some very exciting work going on in Chatham County. Uh, again, citizen science, uh, working with high school students, in fact. Uh, this is work being led by Georgia Tech, by Savannah, by uh, Chatham County to build sea level, a network of sea level sensors to get real time information on uh, sea level rise in the coast. Uh, again, tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, Jill Gamble, who's not uh, on the webinar today, but Jennifer Klein, Georgia DNR, several people who spoke on the coastal webinar a few months ago uh, are doing just tons and tons of work, which is incredibly important to try to build resilience to a changing climate. Last one, and I'm going to use this to hand over to uh, our colleague Brandon Ellis on the IT side, is uh, what do we do with drought and uh, declining water availability, both in southwest Georgia, where it affects agriculture, and upstream, like Lake Lanier that Melissa Hopkinson showed. Uh, so downstream, there's some phenomenal work going on uh, under the banner of smart irrigation. So real innovations being pioneered by farmers in southwest Georgia, by University of Georgia, on how much water to put down, when to put it down, where to put it down, to make the most of a very limited supply of water, especially in a drought situation. Uh, and the other piece, if you go to our Georgia Climate Stories uh, portal, um, this, by the way, is a phenomenal tool that allows you to swim around the state and see different stories. This is the slice of adaptation stories as we have them now. But we just launched last week a story on drought resilience on the Flint, which talks about what's happening across the basin. And if Brandon Ellis is good to go, what I'll do is stop sharing now and ask him to roll just like a minute of that video so you all can see uh, some, some examples and some of the texture in that story. So with that, I'll hand it over to Brandon E, and then from him to Brandon M. So thanks, y'all. People who know the river well have seen the river change. Since the year 2000, we've seen five droughts strike the Flint River Basin. And in every one of those drought events, we see river flows go to severe low flow levels that are lower than any flows recorded during the droughts in the 20th century on the river. In recent years, water utilities, conservationists, and others have been working together mm -hmm. to find ways to restore drought resilience to the river. With climate change, we know we'll have more droughts in the future. And so all these actions add up. They build on one another to restore the river system's own resilience to drought. That benefits communities throughout the area and the health of the river system itself. The 
fue All right, thanks, Brandon. That was a um, just a preview of this video. Again, Georgia Climate Stories, if you go to that website, uh, it's a five minute video that really summarizes a phenomenal, very detailed case study of adaptation efforts on the Flint, both to build this incredible natural wetland system uh, to restore water so that uh, Clayton County gets water when it needs it, but also to make sure that the water is going into the right basins. So Brandon Miller, over to you. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yep, we're good. Okay, uh, Brandon E, I cannot start my video, so I don't know if you can start it on your, hey, there I am, all right. Um, so I think what we can do is go ahead and, and bring in uh, all of our panelists now, and we can just go ahead and turn uh, Daniel's Q&A time into a Q&A time for everybody. Um, and I'll start to ask some of the really, really great questions that we've got from our uh, virtual audience today. Uh, but Daniel, I do want to start with one for you. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk now in the in the national media uh, about this this green conversion and what it will mean for jobs. Um, you know, the the coal, oil, gas industries. Um, you know, there will obviously have to be some job transitions and some job losses. And the the Biden administration has. Uh, you know, said that there will be lots of new jobs, both blue and white collar, high paying jobs. Um, but ultimately, some states will likely be losers. Some states will be winners. Where do you see Georgia falling in this um, potentially? I think if Georgia, it's a very good question. And it's really important, right, to think about, um, I think, one of the first places that policymakers go to when they think about this clean energy transition in some cases is a concern about economic pain. And right. to be clear, uh, there are, you know, we, we should be concerned about that. We should look for industries and job types that might be at risk and make sure that we're mindful of that and acting accordingly, to be sure. It is vitally important though, that as we keep that in one part of our mind, the other part of our mind, we think about the incredibly massive opportunity that this all represents. If you look at that curve of, curve of emissions going down to zero, you don't have to be for the Paris Climate Agreement to understand the market signal that that represents. The entire globe is moving towards a multi-trillion dollar clean energy economy, and it would be crazy for Georgia to sit on the sidelines during that tra transition. Uh, flip side is, I think that Georgia should think very seriously about how it can lead and be a leader in that transition. And there are really good examples of that. Uh, you know, there was, it was only a few short years ago that Georgia was literally number three in the country with respect to deployment of electric vehicles. Uh, so really playing a leading role um, we, Georgia is a top 10 solar state by many metrics. Um, we have uh, potentially, depending on some trade issues, uh, construction of a very big battery facility. Uh, we've had in the past homegrown solar companies. Uh, so there's a real, I think it's a real opportunity for Georgia to think about the opportunity to grow jobs and economic development on, on the shoulders of this clean energy transition. Uh, that Leadership Council for Drawdown Georgia, one of the things that's very exciting about it is it's not just a bunch of environmental nerds, it's folks from across uh, public private sectors, including someone from the Georgia Department of Economic Development, whose job it is to think about how to bring in resources and jobs. So we absolutely do need to think about the downsides, be mindful and, and open, uh, and at the same time, really try to optimize and seize the upside opportunities. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, you mentioned solar. We've gotten several questions about solar and the implementation of it. Um, Sarah Gottlieb asked, the energy, energy industry working on solar is pushing for large-scale solar farms in rural areas, which sometimes result in land conversion. How can we incentivize more rooftop solar where installation is smaller scale and considerably more difficult from a regulatory standpoint? Okay, so really good question. If you go to Drawdown Georgia, that website and that calculator I showed you, you'll see that Dr. Brown and her team have calculated out the difference. They've, they've got rooftop solar and large utility scale solar as different wedges. And this sort of gets to Sarah's question. So solar panels on a rooftop versus these huge farms. They are different. Uh, they do come with challenges. I would say a few things. One is on the utility scale solar side. There's really great work being done by the Nature Conservancy in partnership with UGA actually to think about where you site solar, where you put it in a way that minimizes potential conflict with environmental uh, concerns, uh, especially species that are threatened or endangered. 
Um, so number one, that I would encourage folks to continue to do that quite thoughtfully uh, and intentionally. Number two, Sarah raises a great point about the difference between utility scale and rooftop. One of the differences when South Face ran the number several years ago is in job creation. You create a lot more jobs by putting solar on rooftops uh, than you do with putting massive solar farms out there. So that's really worth advocating for and, and looking for. In terms of how to get it done, that is really up to everyone in this audience to be thinking about and working with their respective counterparts, friends, uh, and, and leaders to talk about. It's something that, uh, to some degree, the Georgia Public Service Commission has a role to play in. Uh, very much counties uh, who have their own ordinances have a role to play in, as well as the Georgia government. So certainly worth thinking about and centering as an issue, which is um, once we're in the world of trying to get clean energy as much of it as possible, we then are, can afford to be in a world of thinking about which types of clean energy we really want to make sure we're, we're advancing. Great. Another question for you, Daniel. Um, Hunter Nobis asked, would it be in the state's best interest to implement a statewide emissions requirement for motor vehicles? Uh, I believe the only Metro Atlanta counties that have these uh, are only Metro Atlanta counties have these requirements in place currently. Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, you know, Dr. Rich Simmons at Georgia Tech ran the working group on transportation for Drawdown Georgia. So first thing I'd say is he's more expert in this than I am. Second thing I'll say though is this question about emission standards for vehicles underscores one of the challenges of moving forward on climate solutions, which is that solutions need to happen at all levels from global to national to state to organizational to individual. But sometimes the levers that drive those solutions are in different spaces from where the action needs to happen. So for Georgia to have a lot more EVs, consumers need to buy more EVs. But it turns out the standards that I think are being referred to here, those are federal standards. So there are national standards on the fuel efficiency of vehicles and the carbon emissions from vehicles, which really get handed down to Georgia and have to be implemented there. So in some respects, the fuel efficiency and carbon emission standards are going to be coming to Georgia. Uh, but there are any number of other things that Georgia has done in the past, actually, to incentivize the adoption and deployment of EVs, which we could do more of in the future. Great. Well, thank you for answering that. Um, so we've got everybody back in. Melissa and Marshall are joining us as well. Um, a question I think that'll be more for you guys, uh, as it's more of a weather pattern question. And we've got it a couple of times in here, both uh, Mark McConnell and uh, David Kyler have asked questions about, and it's very newsy and buzzy right now, um, about how AMOC, which is the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, the um, ocean, think of the Gulf Stream, uh, slowing down, how is that slowing down going to affect weather patterns? And that's especially newsy right now as a new study just came out um, yesterday from, from Nature um, saying this exact thing. And for those of you uh, maybe brains are spinning. What, what are they talking about? Um, it was actually the premise for the movie The Day After Tomorrow, obviously fictionalized and, uh, you know, Hollywooded up for everything. But that was the sort of general premise of it is this ocean circulation slowed down and it threw the whole planet out of whack. Um, you know, the, the study just came out yesterday, but it's something scientists have known about for many years and have talked about. Would, would either of you two like to talk about that? And, and for Georgia specifically, maybe what... Um, what the impacts could be. Sure, I could start. Um, and if Marshall wants to jump in afterwards, um, he can go ahead. Um, I will add, it's just a funny side note. When the day after tomorrow came out, I was a graduate student in the Ice Core lab. We were thrilled that the hero of an action movie was a paleoclimatologist Ice Core guy. So the, our whole lab went and was cheering. Yay. <laughs> I like that movie for funny reasons. Yay. But anyway, um, yes. So the idea is as you basically dense, cold, salty water sinks. So in the North Atlantic, the water's cold. It's salty because when sea ice forms, it leaves the salt in the liquid water. So anyway, you get sinking dense water. As more fresh water um, melts, we get less dense water up there, slowing down this pulling, the water that's being pulled northward, which means a weakening Gulf Stream um, which is the northward current next to kind of going north along our coastline would slow down. The effects of that would be very regional. Um, Europe could have cooler temperatures in terms of the southeast. We may have warmer temperatures and this is like I said, this is just speculation, um, but we may have warmer temperatures as that 
warmth is not transported north and eastward. Um, at the same time, it's possible we would have less frequent hurricanes if we have kind of a moving southward of the high pressure, slightly cooler water. So we could have kind of a more southward band of hot water. Um, however, that could be balanced out by a warming sea overall. Um, so there may not be a huge, maybe it would cause kind of a neutral impact on hurricanes locally. Of course, this is a very mm -hmm. local to the North Atlantic issue. Um, sure. So I, that's a kind of bunch of rambling, but I guess the point is regional impacts, possibly hotter temperatures with less heat being transported towards the mm -hmm. North Atlantic. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it sort of fits in the weirder part of, uh, of what we've been talking about today. You know, there's, there's so many things that we know are happening. There's so many things that we think are going to happen. Um, but there's also a lot that we don't know. And, and that's kind of what's what can be really scary. Um, you know, about global climate change. Um, shameless plug, uh, we are currently um, about to come out with a story on that AMOC circulation uh, for CNN. So uh, editing that story kind of as we speak. So when we got two questions about it, I was like, all right, great. I'm glad we're doing the, the story. Um, so another question we have, um, Daniel, this one will probably be for you. Uh, from my colleague at CNN, Chad Myers, um, he says, when reading Drawdown, there is a cost to benefit for each one of the 100 solutions. What are the most cost effective per benefit solution for Georgia's 20? Oh, man, it's a great question. Uh, I don't have, didn't have that slide in. Um, what, here's what I'm going to do. I, we have some initial answer. Again, Dr. Brown and her team ran a, what's called a marginal abatement cost curve to look at every single one of those wedges and actually cost it out. It's okay with you, Brandon. I'm going to ask that you go on to a different question. I'm going to pull up that data and give okay. you more answer. Okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, Sarah Gottlieb, who's put a, a number of really good questions in here, asked a, a question about growing trees on private land is a huge part of Georgia's economy and is a key part of the drawdown solution. Absent a price on carbon, how can tree farmers be incentivized to grow trees in the most optimal way to sequester carbon? Another drawdown question. Yeah, another really good question. Again, one, one of the beauties of this field, and I forget who said, pointed out how cross-cutting climate is. It was you, Brandon, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's literally the entire economy that's kind of at stake here. It's also the entire economy that kind of can and, and really has an opportunity to move, including niches of the economy that, again, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on Georgia's forestry right. industry. I will say big picture that Georgia's forest industry is massive, right? It's north of $30 billion a year. Um, Number two, I will say that Georgia's forest, you saw very quickly, I showed this graph where there's that gray wedge of carbon sink. Last time I looked at the numbers, Georgia's forests alone sequester about as much carbon as the entire country of Norway emits every year. So like Georgia's yeah. forests are offsetting noise emissions on an annual basis. That's how big our natural carbon sink is. And that's how important it is to the Earth's climate and to Georgia's overall emissions. So. Point number one, just to reinforce the question, it's a really huge sink already and has the potential to be even larger sink if you go to Drawdown Georgia and look at that. Likewise, there's an opportunity to add more trees by thinking about things like silvopasture. Um, with respect to how to do it and how to incentivize it, um, it's a good question that I'll only give my 80,000 foot understanding of it, which is the two challenges seem to be, uh, we have to keep existing forests in forests and we have and provide incentive structures there for a lot of private landowners who are the majority of forest owners in Georgia. And we also have to incentivize people to create new forests where there weren't before. There is an active discussion, and I won't comment on the pros or cons right now, but there's an active discussion in the Georgia legislature right now actually on a bill that would make it a little bit easier for foresters in Georgia to get carbon credits for the work they are doing to sequester carbon. So that's certainly one possible avenue that's actually in, in active play right now. And the last thing I'll say is that um, when we had a Georgia climate conference in 2019, uh, we were delighted that the Georgia Forestry Association, their president spoke at the conference and really spoke to the role that he saw and sees Georgia's forest playing and being part of the climate solution. Great. Yeah, thank you for, for answering that one. Um, a really good question we have here that um, is a question I get a lot and I'm sure all of you do as well. And this is open for anybody who wants to, to take it. How can we mainstream climate discussions in our school system? Um, and, and I think that starts at the elementary level all the way up through 
uh, you know, where all of us work also on the on the university level, but but just starting in the um, elementary level, where could we really mainstream these discussions in schools? Melissa, do you want to go on that? Um, yes, and I don't have a professional opinion. I have a parent opinion, <laughs> maybe. Um, so I noticed that even as in kindergarten, the students, my children, are learning about weather. And I feel like there is a key opening there. I don't, I don't know if it's because weather is accessible, but kindergarten on every science unit seems to be about weather, which I'm always very excited about. But I feel like we could really easily, especially given the tendency for, not tendency, the um, fact that more and more schools are trying to be STEM certified and have this kind of interdisciplinary character, given the intercutting nature of climate science, it could somehow, I feel like using the fact that weather is taught to all elementary school kids, and that's my current world, of kids and, and that climate change is interdisciplinary. There's a lot of potential to introduce it in science and make it sort of an interdisciplinary STEM sort of um, program in a lot of schools. But like I said, I'm kind of on the elementary as a parent and college as a professional extremes. I don't know. Um, it seems like there's a lot of potential in the middle and high school as well in terms of this in, interdisciplinary nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would add, I also have elementary school aged children and, you know, the, the recycling and some of the environmental parts of, of the story have long been taught. I mean, my, my children have, have said to me multiple times, you know, oh, I, I don't want a plastic water bottle and daddy, what can we do about plastic pollution and things? So they can handle this stuff. They understand it. Um, but, you know, prioritizing some of the weather impacts uh, that climate change is happening. I agree with you. I think could very easily be incorporated into the weather discussions that they do starting at kindergarten. And for, I spoke to my uh, first graders class just the other week, which is one of the good things of the work from home time is we can do more things like this, I feel like. And I, I've certainly done a few more uh, school speaking engagements because it's easy to, to fit into my day. Um, but I make sure to talk about climate change as part of that, um, you know, just the basics and you don't have to scare them, um, you know, but just let let them know that, that this is something that we know and we're learning more about. Um, Brandon, I've got the, uh, that, the answer to Chad's question, if that's helpful. Perfect, yes. Let me pull that up. Let me know if this screen shows, are you guys getting that? Yes. Okay. So this is analysis from, again, from Marilyn Brown and company at Georgia Tech and that team. Uh, it might have evolved a little bit. This is their initial cut, but uh, this is one of those pictures that takes a thousand words to explain, but then is worth more than 10,000 words. Um, bottom line is each of these verticals is one of the solutions to draw down Georgia. And whether it, if it's below this zero line, that means it makes you money over time is their estimate. If it's up here, it means it costs you money over time. So everything from reduced food waste all the way over to alternative mobility, which is roughly 15 million tons of reduction, in theory is actually so cheap that it would make you money over the life cycle of that investment. So if you think about energy efficient trucks, there's a capital cost up front, but it pays back for itself over time and save fuel costs, likewise recycling, cogeneration, et cetera. Uh, all these have uncertainty bands and ranges, high, medium, and low, but I think uh, for Chad's specific questions, I would definitely encourage him reaching out to Dr. Brown and her team because they really have started to dig into trying to get a sense of which of these is going to be the easiest to pull off economically speaking. Okay, cool. All right, well, we are uh, at 1230. So I will, uh, I will hand it back over to Rachel to, uh, to end things. But thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you for everybody for uh, participating in all of the great questions. This has been awesome. Yeah. And thank you to our amazing host, Brandon Miller, who did such a fabulous job handling all of those questions that were coming in from the audience. Uh, we really have appreciated everyone, the panel or the participants who have joined today, in addition to um, Dr. Hopkinson, Dr. Shepard, Daniel Rockberg, and of course, Brandon Miller, and also our organizers behind the scenes, Jill Gamble, Jenna Frankie, and um, Brandon Ellis, who's been helping us out with IT. 
So we're right on time to wrap this up. You can uh, learn more about Georgia Climate Project on our website, georgiaclimateproject.org. We'll also be posting a, a recording of today's webinar. You'll all be getting an email about that. Also, please let us know how we did today. Feel free to fill out our survey. We're always looking at those to make these better. Thank you again for coming and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye all.